do rag. Nothing personal. Word of the day. Today's Thursday, June 3rd. The word of the day is do rag. Something that is worn on players' heads. And it is a word that is associated with black people and is a word that you don't joke around about. It's a descriptive word. And when it's said by someone who's white, it comes off as racist, whether or not the person who says it is racist. It comes off as racist. So you don't talk about it. And if you do talk about it, you talk about it not as a joke. You talk about it with sensitivity. You talk about it as an adjective. Although why, when you're an analyst for a baseball game, you would talk about somebody's hair is beyond me, unless they're in violation of the Yankee hair policy, can't go below the helmet line. Bob Brenly is the World Series winning champion, ship manager for Arizona. He won the World Series back in 2001 when they beat the Yankees on the Luis Gonzalez walk-off. That was fun, if you're a Yankee fan. So Bob Renly is now an analyst for the Diamondbacks, and Bob Renly was calling a game. Marcus Stroman was pitching, and Bob, Bob Renly says, and I quote, it was a pretty easy quote to quote, I'm pretty sure that's the same do-rag that Tom Seaver used to wear when he pitched for the Mets. Well, that caused quite a firestorm. Marcus Stroman was disappointed. Luis Rojas, the manager of the Mets, said it was inappropriate. And then, of course, what happens next? You know how it goes. It's statement time. Bob Brenly releases a statement. I made a poor attempt at humor that was insensitive and wrong. I apologize to Marcus Stroman, and I've reached out directly to share those thoughts. I've had several conversations with the Diamondbacks, and we agree that seeking sensitivity training is an important step so I can continue to learn from my mistakes in order to be better in the future. Holy crap. It's all about sensitivity training. It's what everybody says. I made a homophobic joke. I got to go to sensitivity training. Cheated on my significant other. I got to go to sex addict camp. I showed up late to work. I got to go to rehab. I got caught sleeping at the wheel. I got to do both. I say something anti-Semitic, I'm gonna go meet with rabbis. I say something anti-black, I'm gonna go meet with black people. I say something anti-short, I'm going to a short person's convention and I'm gonna get sensitivity training. That's the catchword these days. I wonder what that means, sensitivity training. How do you train someone to be sensitive exactly? Isn't it training someone to know the difference between right and wrong? Or isn't it really training someone to not be racist if they're racist or sexist if they're sexist or misogynistic if they're, mis if they're a misogynist? I think that's what it really is. But you're taught that when you are a public figure and you make a mistake, you have to enter into quote unquote sensitivity training and go on the apology tour, which of course, nobody ever follows up on any of that. I wonder how Myers Leonard is doing with all of his meetings with the rabbis. Good. I don't think sensitivity training is what you need. I think we got to change the way the statements go. I think what Bob Renly should have said is that either claim ignorance, which is not an affirmative defense. I didn't know that saying do rag was a word that would make people think I'm racist or go the other way and say, I wouldn't have said that if Marcus Stroman had been white and that is my prejudice. And that's something that I'm ashamed of, but is ingrained in me. Implicit bias. What bothers me most about the story, though, is not what Bob Renly apologized for. Not even what Bob Renly said. I'm trying to understand, and it boggles my mind, and I've used this platform to say it before, and I'm going to say it again. Do you really care if someone's black? or brown, or red, or green. I'm just asking. Marcus Stroman got a Instagram direct message, and I'm saying the guy's name because if you know him, then you're like him. Let me say it in a nicer way. If you are friends with him, and you didn't know this about him, and now you listen to the show, and now you know if you're still friends, that means you're like him. Purportedly, his name is Kevin Sawyer. I don't know whether or not that's his name. 
He's got 330 followers on Instagram. He DM'd Marcus Stroman and said, kill yourself, N-word, with a vomit emoji. Straight up, jit, I literally beat your frail skull in with one hand. F-U-N-B-I-T-C-H. Marcus Stroman shared that, and I was so angry to read it. Who do we think we are? Who do you think you are, Kevin Sawyer? Social media is a positive thing, but God, there's so much negativity because it enables people to have this cyber courage. It enables people to say things that are so wrong. But again, that's not my issue. Not saying them, but thinking them, that's just as wrong. How somebody would feel that they have the right to contact Marcus Stroman and say what this guy said is beyond me. How we as a society continue to hold people accountable, that should be your focus. Instead of having statements about sensitivity training or apology tours, why aren't we focusing at the root of the issue that causes people to think the way they think, say the things they say, and do the things they do? Why don't we start with that? And I know just how to do it. It starts with an open line of communication where there are consequences to the words that you say. Even if you plead ignorance, even if you plead insanity, even if you say you are going to get help, training, therapy, et cetera, that when you are a public figure and anyone with a platform is now a public figure, you're on Instagram, you're a public figure. You've got one follower, you are a public figure. You exhibit any sort of racism in any sort of way, you're not just canceled, you're done. You're off the platform. Start with that. You are not allowed to share your views, period, if those views spew hatred or prejudice. Two, you're out of a job. Let's make it a federal law that anyone who is caught being racist, and I mean caught in a way where they have a due process, where Kevin Sawyer can say he got hacked, where there is proof done, if we're willing to do a $6 trillion budget, I'm willing to make part of that budget into our legal system, which stops this at its core with consequences. And the only consequence that people care about is money. That's it. Everyone thinks they can say whatever they want, do whatever they want. If it doesn't impact their pocketbook, they don't care. You have a certain president. If my taxes are down, I'm happy. If he's racist and I'm racist, but I don't talk about it or he doesn't talk about it or we both talk about it, but I'm still have more money at the end of the month, I'm happy. If I rush on the court or if I throw stuff at players or if I send tweets or insta direct messages at players, but I still get my job and my paycheck and everything's still good, I'm happy. Well, I'm about to make you unhappy. Is that too much? Is that a draconian punishment in your mind? Think Bob Brenly would, act differently if he lost his job, couldn't get another job? Are you saying that I'm breaking the law by telling people they can't earn a living? And the irony of that is I earn a living with my mouth, which means I'm one word away, except the reason why you'll never hear me say the word is I don't think the word. I have nothing to be worried about. Am I gonna drop an F-bomb from time to time? Yeah. I can't get any support for this because people are not in favor of taking any money out of anybody's pocket. They're more willing to let them say what they think and have them think these thoughts. They're more willing to do all of that than say, oh no, you no longer get your 50 grand, 70 grand, 100 grand, 500 grand, 2 million, 10 million, 100 million. You don't get any of that. It's always about money and it's why we have a show. It's not that I'm sick of the show, I love the show. I love that you rate, review, follow. I love everything about nothing personal. I love working with Coke every day, even when he doesn't record. And we have to do the show twice. And the second show is better than the first, or maybe it's worse. We'll never know. I love the fact that we can talk about topics, but today's show, I have to talk about race norming now because it makes me so angry that this stuff is happening. Race norming is going on in the NFL. Let me tell you the backstory. And let me explain to you why we have a bit of a situation that the NFL finds itself in. 
Let's start with way back when, when people were getting the crap kicked out of them. They couldn't see straight. They told they were told to aim for the middle player with the ball because they saw three players because they had a concussion, but they were told to play. They got some smelling salts. They got a shot of Toradol, and they're right back in there. All of a sudden, the players are getting older, and they're turning into Jim McMahon. They're killing themselves because of concussions, and their brains just aren't working. It's literally the term when your brains get bashed in. So the NFL got sued, class action suit regarding concussions. There was a settlement, the settlement was approved, but then you gotta figure out how you give the money to people. Because what the NFL does is they give a vat of money into an account, and then there are administrators of that account who give money to former players who are suffering from dementia. How do you do it? Isn't that the important question? Of course, it's not the important question is, why do we agree to bet on and so immerse ourselves in a sport where we know it's gladiators who are gonna die? I guess the answer is we've been doing that for thousands of years, why would we stop? And the people who are the gladiators know they're gonna die like matadors or skydivers or free divers, solo divers. It's part of the game, I guess. Okay, I'll give you that. They're going in with their eyes wide open. Unless they're not. Unless the players didn't realize. Unless the players didn't realize that they were in danger of suffering concussions. But let's get past all that. They have the concussions. The money gets put in the account. How do you decide who gets how much? Do you have to be the most, the biggest sufferer of dementia? Do you have to be a good player? Should you have had to have had five concussions and not know the name of two out of four of your children and not able to hold a steady job? Is that the criteria? Well, it turns out what they do is they choose a baseline of mental acumen, and then they test you. And depending on how far below you are of that baseline, that will dictate how much money you get. And it's doctors doing this, not the NFL. I want to be clear. It's doctors doing this. The NFL knows about it. They approve of it, but it's doctors. Then we found out that the NFL was doing something that was actually intended to help black players but ended up being unbelievably, ridiculously racist and hurt black players. What am I talking about? It's something called race norming. Race norming is when you assume that black players have lower cognitive function to start with. Think about that statement. That is something the NFL read and said, yeah, that makes sense. We're gonna do that. Black people, by definition, are less intelligent than white people. Therefore, when they test the black person and they are not down on the scale from where they started enough, they don't get enough money. Am I making myself perfectly clear? If you were part of Mensa and then you can't tie your shoes, you're gonna get a fortune. If you start off as being someone who could barely tie your shoes and then you can't tie your shoes, it's hard to prove it was because of the NFL concussions. Therefore, you're going to get less money. The further you fall, the more money you get. Therefore, every player wants to start as high as they can on the scale. And they said, if you're black, by definition, you can't start as high on the scale as a white person. Think about that. This was all done in the 1990s. Over 20 years ago is when this concept started, by the way. And that's what race norming is. And the theory always was the NFL should not participate in this race norming. They should find a more equitable way to distribute the proceeds from the concussion account, but they didn't care. They didn't care because they wanted to distance themselves from the concussion lawsuit. They wanted to pay the money and run run away from the reality that their sport that they want the youth to play is leading to brain damage, that is leading to dementia, that is sometimes leading to death. So what did a pair of black players do who couldn't get any money? 
they said we're filing a lawsuit, a civil rights lawsuit. They filed it over the practice of race norming. They found a way to have this lawsuit heard, but it was thrown out. It was thrown out by the judge who was overseeing the settlement because the judge said, hey, you guys all came up together with this plan. I'm not gonna opine whether I agree with the plan or not, but part of this class action lawsuit is that the people who were harmed and the people who did the harming, they got together, they sang Kumbaya, and they said, here's a billion dollars, I'm making up the number, split it up the following way. Okay. That's the plan and they're gonna stick to it. Do you know that more than 2,000 NFL retirees have filed dementia claims, but only around 600 have received awards? Do you know that more than half of all NFL retirees are black, according to all the lawyers? And do you know that the reason that this is becoming such a huge story and the reason why we have to think about these things is that it has become normal for us as a society to rank people whether it's by height, by weight, by color, by IQ, by credit score, that has been a constant in our society. In a competitive society, that's what it is, right? Sports, what I loved about sports, at the end of every day, 162 days a year, I was either a winner or a loser. 18 years of 162 days where I valued myself as a winner or a loser according to a score of a game. It's insanity. As I think back to that, it's insanity. The emotional involvement that you have in sports, that's why there's so much anger and vitriol toward players and your team doesn't win. Wait till get, by the way, on a side note here, Coca, can you imagine right now on your phone, I can gamble on games, depending on where you live. You go into a city where gambling is legal and all of a sudden you see on your Twitter feed or Instagram feed, you see that William Hill is offering you, sign up for the app, get the app, you're now in the location that works. You get the app, you start gambling, you go to a game, you gamble, you cheer when the game goes over, you sigh when the game is under, you scream when the home team doesn't cover. You get angry when a good player doesn't play well because you have a prop bet on the number of points he's going to score or the number of TDs he's going to throw. You can bet on anything, including the flip of the coin of the national anthem of the Super Bowl. And our view is, isn't this special? How great is it? We have a whole network devoted to gambling. There's companies, billion-dollar companies. All they do is make sure that you understand that we're taking your money. Ever wonder why casinos are so nice? It's because you paid for them. Ever wonder why bookies are so rich? Because you paid for their house. Ever wonder why there's so many people giving you picks of the day who don't know shit? Because you take them and bet on them. Sponsors like that. DraftKings gave Levitard $50 million. $50 million. Because DraftKings wants to take all the money they're getting from you in fantasy and gambling, and they want to create content and do make a content media play. It's actually quite something, isn't it? I'm not sure why we were talking about gambling, except to say this, it wasn't even in the rundown. There's so many different ways that football is acting that if you think they're gonna take the time to actually care about race norming, they're not. They want to run away from that concussion settlement so fast your head would spin off. Whoop. We're not gonna let them do it. No, we're not. I got to talk about Danny Ainge again. Two straight days of Danny Ainge. That's very strange that I would ask to do that. But the reason why I want to do it is something came up when he resigned yesterday. And it led to a conversation between me and Coca that I want to involve you in because it's interesting to me. Danny Ainge claimed it was his decision that he was tired and he wanted to step away. He's been thinking about it for months. He had a heart attack a couple of years ago. He wanted to spend time with his family, blah, 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 blah. If they're still in the playoffs, he's not stepping away. If they make it to the finals, he's not stepping away. If they don't lose 4-1 to the Nets, he's not stepping away. No one steps away after winning a championship. I say no one, but that's probably going to be proven wrong by someone. It is rare. But what interested me is Danny Ainge talked about the fact that it was the bubble and the pandemic that did him in. 
He said the last couple of years have been tough because of the pandemic, the bubble, all the rules, the scrutiny protocols that we had to go through has not made the job as much fun. And it got me thinking and it got Coca thinking. The thing about the bubble and the pandemic, it's impacted all of us. It's impacted your kids and how they go to school and how they interact at school. It's impacted you at work. It's impacted you when you walk into a store the quote unquote return, return to normalcy is based on not having to wear a mask and being able to see people again and be around people again, be in crowds again. I've always been a germaphobe. I don't like being in big crowds when people are sneezing. I had a job where I had to shake people's hands, but I would fist bump as much as possible. I'd carry around sanitizer at all times. And now it's more normal. People are catching up to me in that regard. But I think what we did not take into account enough and we're now beginning to see it. And it's been a topic of du jour, set some men, topic of the day this week, mental health. People were very greatly impacted by the pandemic, being quarantined at home, not being able to work, losing their jobs, getting sick, having family members sick, maybe dying, having players forced to go into the bubble, which even though it was Disney World was not the place you'd wanna be. These things were not easy on people mentally, and we're beginning to see the impact of it now, but we're just starting. Do you really know the impact on all the people who could, basically lost their junior and senior year in high school or junior and senior year in college, or they couldn't go to school in third grade and it was all virtual for a year and a half? Do we know the impact on people's ages? What if a five-year-old didn't learn to read the right way and it's gonna impact that person? It's gonna impact then our economy? I think we're just beginning to see the ripple effect of COVID on this country, on this world. But if an athlete talks about weakness, the way Osaka talks about mental health, the way Kevin Love talked about mental health, the way players are beginning to talk about it more, but they're still sort of looked at strangely, like you suffer from that, how could you ever be anxious? There was an NBA player who came out yesterday, Coca, and I'm blanking. I wanna say it was Aldrich the guy who just retired. And he was talking about his depression, how he had a very hard time uh, basically playing basketball at all. And people listen to that. They have a little bit of sympathy, but really they don't. What they're wondering is, is how can you be weak when you're rich? How can you be weak when it seems as though you have everything in the world to live for, everything to play for? Your life is perfect. And then we read about athletes whose personal lives go bad. We love to tear them down and then build them up like we do with Tiger Woods. And we say, wow, maybe that person is more like me. Maybe that person does feel the way I feel, do the things I do, have the arguments with my significant other that I have. But we don't let athletes have that. As a society, we want athletes to be different just like we want our actors to be different. We want them to be perfect. And when they're shown to not be perfect, it's like schadenfreude a little bit, where happiness and the misfortune of others, where we look and say, ooh, I guess this person does suffer from what I suffer from, except I suffer making $70,000 a year and he suffers making $10 million a year or $20 million a movie. So it's not really suffering, is it? I think we have to stop correlating money with mental health. Just because you have money doesn't mean that you're happy. You know, the expression money doesn't buy happiness, but it certainly helps. I've known so many unhappy rich people in my life, I can't even tell you. And so many happy middle class and poor people. The majority of the people I meet in the, like the owner category, the billionaire category, Miserable, miserable for whatever reason. Always wanting more, never feeling like they have enough. Always wanting to show they've got the biggest bulge in their pants. Whatever the case may be, there's never enough and maybe that's what drives them. And then we read about Bill Gates and maybe he led a double life or a triple life. Wow, he's such a computer geek. I can't believe he was hitting on people in his office or at conferences. And then you look around and say, well, wait a minute, that happens every day, all the time but not with Bill Gates, not when you're rich. When you're rich, everything's perfect. I think we have to say it's okay for athletes not to be perfect. 
Coco was saying to me before the show, what if LeBron James had come out and said, you know what? The bubble was just too much for me. The pandemic is too much. I'm sitting out. I can't. I can't play. I'm sorry for my team. I'm sorry to disappoint fans, but I've had enough. He'd get crushed, wouldn't he? It's the second time this week that I've said we have to look in the mirror. Second time. When we come back, we're going to review a movie. We're going to talk about doctoring baseballs and MRIs. I watched an amazing movie yesterday, Coke. I cannot wait to tell you about it. A zero glance movie is about to be reviewed. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's me, David. I'm here with Coca. Can you hear me? Are we recording, Coca? First of all, you got so much love on my Twitter yesterday, Coca. You were so mean to him. Everybody makes mistakes. You're supposed to press record. I don't think I was mean at all. But people say that during the show yesterday, I made fun of you and I mocked you. And I just want to say, Matthew, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to make fun of you. I just meant to be pissed off at you. We still watch a movie every day and we get to review it. I watched a movie on Amazon called Francis Ferguson. I never heard of it. It's 74 minutes, 74 minutes of a movie that is narrated by Nick Offerman, the guy from Where the Millers. You've heard of him. I think he's in something else that I've never seen. I'm going to get this wrong, Coca. Was Nick Offerman the guy in Parks and Rec? by chance? And is Nick Offerman by chance the one married to Brian Cranston's wife in Why Him with Franco and Zoe Deutsch? I want to say her name is Megan Mullally, but I think I'm off on that. In any case, Nick Offerman narrates this movie about a teacher who has sex with a student and what happens to her. Boring. That's like a Tuesday. Wasn't there a case, uh, what's the most famous case? Is it Pamela Smart? Was she the most famous teacher to have sex with a student? Like who was, he was 13 at the time and they ended up getting married and having a bunch of kids, a bunch of TV movies about it. I I am absolutely very likely mixing this up because today's Thursday and I'm a little fatigued because I had to record two shows yesterday for the price of one and do Levitard yesterday. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, I think it was Pamela Smart, but it doesn't matter. So Francis Ferguson is a uninteresting, disinterested movie about a story that we all know about. So how can it be a zero glance movie? Because it's totally different than any movie you've ever seen. It is quite fascinating the way Nick Offerman narrates the movie, how it gets narrated, the way the script is, and the actress who plays the teacher whose name is... uh, I wasn't going to write her name down because I wanted to remember it because she was in the movie called The Highwayman with... Kevin Costner and Woody Harrelson. I want to say it's Kali Wellness, but I'm probably wrong. But it's something like that. And it shows her journey as a miserable wife to a miserable substitute teacher to having committed this crime, to serving time, to getting out, to being on parole. But it's done by a narrator. It's fascinating. It's only an hour and 14. It's a zero glancer. I strongly suggest it. Do you remember I talked about uh, before how annoying it is to gamble on games and to lose in such a bad way? Well, it happened last night, and I'm furious about it. People think that I'm not on the Marlins. I'm on them. But they keep losing, and I'm going to stop choosing them. So I don't think I can go with the Marlins again. Pablo Lopez pitched fine. Four innings, 90 pitches. It's infuriating. Four innings for 90 pitches? The bullpen has been lights out for the Marlins, but Garcia gave up three runs in the bottom of the ninth. Three runs and the Blue Jays walked him off. Damn it. We're now only 23 games over 500. We're still in the positive, 76 and 53, but I'm going away from baseball because I'm annoyed. I'm going to basketball to a game we're all going to watch. What do you think happens? The Lakers are down 3-2. The Clippers are down 3-2 to the Mavs, which last night I'm watching that uh, game. Thinking to myself, it is unbelievable. When is the last time there's been the first five games of a series all won by the road team? I didn't look it up because I didn't want to GTS it. But I'll tell you something. It was very interesting to me. So the 
Clippers and Lakers, if they both lose, Steve Ballmer and Jeannie Buss are going to lose their minds. The Lakers are favored to win the title. Why? I don't know. With AD Hurt, they're not the best team. Even with him, they're probably not the best team. The Clippers likely can't get past the Mavericks, even though they've got four or five players playing well, and the Mavericks have Luka, and that's it. Sometimes Hardaway. Porzingis is a definite mediocre support guy at best. I think LA is going to go into a tizzy. The Dodgers are not in first place. The Clippers and Lakers could be eliminated. How did the Los Angeles Kings do in the NHL? What about the Galaxy? Did David Beckham have a good game for the Galaxy this year? Is he having a good season? Anyway, the Lakers aren't going to lose tonight. Lakers are home and they're only giving two points. And I know AD's not playing. And I know AD should be worth three to four points. And maybe you think that it should be Lakers minus five. Or maybe the Suns should be favored without AD because the Suns are the top seed. LeBron James will not lose the series in LA. He will go back to Phoenix for a game seven. This series is going seven. The pick tonight is Lakers minus two. How good would you feel if you were a minor league baseball player and you got suspended for doctoring a baseball? and you were being made an example of because Major League Baseball is trying to deal with this, and so they're finding minor leaguers to suspend, aren't you going to be pissed off when you know everyone around you is doing the same thing, but they nail you, and you get suspended 10 games, and you're the one who's Googleable, and you work, whether whatever, in the White Sox organization, in the Giants organization, does it really matter? You're somewhere, and MLB has said, it's enough. Offenses stink. We're getting to the bottom of it. Too many strikeouts. We are stopping the doctrine of baseballs. And I said to you on nothing personal, give me a break. You're never going to stop it. I am stopping office romances. That's it. They're done. I am stopping all one night stands with people who meet at bars. Done. If you say it, does it like you just put it in the universe? Does that mean it just happens? MLB said, we are stopping the doctrine of baseballs. We're going to catch you. Like Isla Fisher and Wedding Crashers. I will find you. <laughs> it doesn't take Dick frickin' Tracy to find Dr. Baseballs, folks. They're all doctored. Do you know what we have to do before a ball can be put in play for a regular season game? We have to doctor it. It's not new balls. You know, in tennis, they're playing, and then all of a sudden you hear from the umpire in the chair, new balls, please. And everyone's all excited because they bounce, so you want to be the person serving when the new balls come into play. When the umpire holds up four fingers and he motions to the ball boy, come here with balls. And then he gets the balls, he puts them in his pocket, and he puts the balls in play because every time a ball hits the ground, they throw the ball away, which is ridiculous. That is $7.99 every time they do that. I found myself counting after a while the number of balls that were taken out of play, having to buy more balls, more balls, more balls, so many balls from Rawlings, just balls are everywhere. Guess what we do with the balls when they come in? We mess them up. We put mud on them. We dirty them. We make them so they're not new. They're doctored to start with. And then the pitchers get them. They put sunscreen and rosin and pine tar and various other things. They shave them down. They put their fingernails in them. Have you ever looked at a pitcher's fingernails? You may want to check that out the next time you shake someone's hand. They will have a, a fingernail that someone would say, wow, is that for cocaine? And you say, no, actually, it's for my breaking ball. But MLB said, oh, no, now's the time. We are decrying decrying we are giving you a formal decree we can't get any major leaguers caught but we're trying get out there joe west and get rid of some hats and let's see if we can suspend some people but for now we're going to stick to the minor leagues do you see a pattern by the way the minor leagues are like the guinea pigs for the big leagues all the rule changes start at the minor league level all of the what is it called, Coco, when you have rules that you are then making sure people follow? It's happening. It's happening. Today's the day. Today's the day when my word recall disappears. Minor leagues is where they take the rules and enforce them. That's the word. Thank you, Coca. Except Coca's not even listening to the show anymore. Are we recording anymore? I don't see that we're recording. Hello? 
Okay. Can you hear me? Can you show me proof of life? Say something. Hello. All right. I'm not going to talk then. I'm done. Show's over. There he is. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> oh, you make me laugh. You really do. So they go to the minor leagues. They take balls out of play. And now all of a sudden, four guys have been suspended for doctoring baseballs. And do you know what MLB is doing? They're going to have an owner's meeting, regularly scheduled owner's meeting. It's, a, it's the first in-person meeting since the pandemic. Of course, they're doing it in New York because that's where the commissioner is. Do you know we used to have owner's meetings in Arizona in January because that's where the commissioner was? And then owner's meetings in Milwaukee or Chicago because that's near where the commissioner was. We got an owner's meeting in Florida because that's where the new commissioner was during the winter. He was a Florida guy, not an Arizona guy. It doesn't take a true detective to figure out where these meetings are. New York is not exactly in the middle of the country. I always thought meetings should always be in the middle of the country, make everyone fly halfway, even though they all have private planes. What's the difference? And maybe you'd rather inconvenience only half the people, the full country, than all the people half the country. But then the people in the middle of the country are not inconvenienced at all. Anyway, I digress. There's an owner's meeting. And the word is, get ready, folks. I, I can't confirm this. I don't have any sources. I'm not that guy. That the owners are going to discuss <gasps> Dr. Baseballs. <laughs> Let me tell you what that means. You sit in an owner's meeting. I've described it to you before. You have your placard in front of you that has your team logo, in case you forgot what team you own or are the president of. And then a presentation will be made. There'll be slides. There'll be written presentations that get emailed to you after so you can share it with other people in the organization. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, we're on it. We now have proof that pitchers are doing the following five things. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what we see. And they show Michael Pineda with some pine tar in his neck. They show the hat of that pitcher. And then they say, here's what the punishments will be. But then the labor people stand up and say, ooh, those aren't the real punishments yet because we haven't really negotiated that with the union, which we have to negotiate. And then they get up and say, the other way we can help offenses is by you signing better players and developing them better without teaching them only launch angle. And then they get up and say, are you sure that you want us to cure the offense? Because the teams in first place would tell the commissioner, we're good. The teams with the highest, uh, lowest ERA, they're good. It's a room full of 30 people trying to act as one organization, as one entity, but they all have differing interests. There are certain teams who know they've got pitchers who are very successful using foreign substances. Guess what? They don't want to crack down. Then you've got the Dodgers who have Trevor Bauer saying, oh, we got to stop all this. So the Dodgers are saying, yeah, we're fighting for it because we think the Padres do it the most. It's all gamesmanship. That's what owners' meetings are. Owners pretend they all like each other, but they're all very competitive. We're going to get a report from the owners' meeting because they're sources all the time. And then Rabu meet the media, and we'll find out exactly what they're doing with the doctored baseballs. <sighs> I'm so excited. I'm shivering. You know who's not excited right now at all? Bob Baffert. Despondent. Why is he despondent? He got suspended for two years. Two years. Do you know why? Remember that horse, Medina Spirit, that won the Kentucky Derby? And if you bet on Medina Spirit, you got paid. And if you bet on Mandaloon, you didn't get paid because Mandaloon finished in second. If you only bet Mandaloon to win, you lost. But now Medina Spirit tested positive for drugs. And then if he gets, if he tests positive again, he'll be disqualified and Mandaloon will be the winner. And guess what? Find your ticket. Go into the garbage can. Go down the disposal. Go back to the track in Kentucky and find your ticket. And then wipe your tuchus with it because Mandaloon will never get paid for winning the Kentucky Derby, even if he's named the winner of the Kentucky Derby, because all bets are final and have nothing to do with post-race drug tests. So if you won with Medina Spirit, you win. What if Bob Baffert, here's the problem with horse racing, folks. What if Bob Baffert put $10 million on Medina Spirit to win, drugged him up completely, he wins, and then Bob Baffert says, hey, I had no idea he had 21 grams of hexamonoclia for his hoof and mouth disease. I wonder if there's any room in horse racing for any sort of activity like that. Hmm. How strange would that be? 
Of course, you've got the Kentucky Racing Commission, the New York Racing Commission, everyone trying to say to everybody, it's all kosher. This isn't high lie. And why are they doing that? Not because they love you, not because they want you to do anything other than feel good about the fact that you bet on these races. And if you feel as though they're fixed, like high lie or wrestling, you're going to be less apt to bet on them, aren't you? So they've got to come down really hard on horses that violate the drug rules. And then they're going to come down really hard on the trainer. Bob Baffert, I can't wait for his statement. I just can't wait for it. Because he claimed, of course, that he had no idea that Medina Spirit was being drugged. He thought it was just some ointment. Well, it got tested again, and there was still the existence of this th stuff in Medina Spirit's blood, body, urine, whatever it is. I, I assume they don't test his crap. That'd be sort of gross, right? Yeah, I think it's just blood and urine. So a big announcement comes. They say that they're going to suspend Baffert, and then they give you the reason. And they talk about the fact, and this is what makes me smile a little bit, that we suspended Bob Baffert, not just because of what he's done with Medina Spirit, but for his transgressions over the course of the last several years. I've always been fascinated by that theory of punishment. There was an example under Clinton called the three strikes and you're out. That's people who were going to prison for dealing dime bags, but if you're caught three times, you get life in prison. For some reason, there's the view of people that if you do something once, eh, do it twice, it's a little worse, do it three times, and that is outrageous because you knew it was bad. But the, by definition, that means that we're assuming when someone does something for the first time, they have some sort of question as to whether or not it's actually bad. Do you think the first time Bob Baffert drugs his horse, he said, you know what, this is fine, we're good. Second time, ooh, I gotta win. I don't wanna give him too much, but I'm just gonna give him just enough. But by the third time, he was like, oh, this is wrong. First time you rob a bank, it's totally normal. Don't need to be punished. Second time, ooh, I think they're scared in that bank. They're concerned. Third time, everyone's on the floor crying, worried about the gun in their face. So you get punished more for the third time than the first time? What if we punish people more the first time and said to them, you know what? We don't need three strikes. You do this and it's got to be bad, right? And it's got to be proportional. I'm a big fan of proportional punishment. Life in prison for dealing a dime bag? No. A suspension for drugging a horse? Yeah. But the first time. But people disagree with me because for whatever reason, they have this feeling that everyone deserves a second chance. Everyone deserves the benefit of the doubt. I'd like to be in a society where there are certain things that you don't get the benefit of that doubt. And we're full circle to the beginning of the show today. You don't get the benefit of the doubt when you're a homophobe or a misogynist or an anti-Semite or a racist. What benefit of the doubt should you get? Oh, I get a second chance. I had a microphone. I didn't know what I was saying. Oh, I didn't know that was a bad word. I never heard of that word. Oh, I didn't realize that drugging a horse is bad. I didn't realize that doctoring a ball was bad. If we're going to make something against the rules, then enforce the rules or don't make it a rule. I think it's pretty simple. We've got to give people as leaders, we have to give followers and followers are just as important as leaders because if there's no followers, who would they, who would the leaders lead, right? But you need to give the rules of the game before you start playing. Can you imagine starting a baseball game? I'm not sure that it's going to be nine innings today. It could be 12, maybe 16. We're not sure. It could be three. You might want to score early. In the NBA, I don't know if you know this, but if you shoot a basket between the four minute and the seven minute mark of the second quarter, it's not going to count. You can't do that. You have to have rules. You have to make sure everyone understands the rules and then you have to enforce the rules. The lack of consistency is what leads to misbehavior. When you inconsistently enforce something, you are asking people to misinterpret that which they can do, how they can act, what they can say or do. And I think that's the biggest part of our problem. I think it's going to get better, though.
because we've got rules here on nothing personal. It's a pretty simple rule. We're going to give you 45 minutes every single day. And that's it. And at the end of the show, we're going to say what we know to be true. It's just business. This is nothing personal. 